I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Pat from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. Per and I first met when he was a guest on my channel, The Great War, to talk about the history behind the Sabaton songs that deal with World War I topics. And The Last Dying Breath is one of those songs. It was about the defense of Belgrade. When the First World War began, the might of the Imperial Austro-Hungarian Army descended on Little Serbia. That didn't work out so well for the giant. And our song, The Last Dying Breath, was inspired by a legendary speech. The fighting in the Great War had returned to the place where it all began. The Austro-Hungarian invasion of Serbia in 1914 had been a complete failure. The Serbs had won resounding victories at places like Cher and Drina and the long battle of Kolubara which even saw the Austrians take Belgrade, though they only held it for two weeks, pushed the Imperial Army back out of Serbia with devastating losses. Well, it was now late 1915 and they were going to try again. Serbia was a major prize. Taking it would give the Austrians one fewer battlefront and it would open up a direct rail supply link from Berlin to Constantinople. This time, it would begin with a combined Austro-German force under Germany's renowned August von Mackensen. He planned to attack Serbia at multiple points on its northern front, while secret negotiations were proceeding with the Bulgarian government about joining the war and then also the Serbian invasion from the east. His plan was simple. The newly reorganized Austro-Hungarian Third Army was to cross the Danube and the Sava west of Belgrade and take the high ground south of the Serbian capital. This would not only isolate the city, but also bind as many Serbian troops to it as possible. Mackensen well knew the importance of the white city for the honor and prestige of the Serbian people. At the same time, his 11th German army under Max von Galwitz would cross the Danube to the east of Belgrade and push further inward into the Morava Valley, threatening the main Serbian forces outside the capital and the city itself from the other side. While the Austro-Hungarians were the anvil, the German army was to be the hammer under which the Serbian army would receive the killing blow. War begun, the Kaiser has come. Day or night, the shells keep falling. Overrun, but never outdone. Street to street, denying defeat. But you know, the Serbs had time to prepare. Months had passed since the defeat of that 1914 invasion, and another attack on the capital was of course anticipated. Both the Danube and the Sava were major obstacles, and the Serbs readied their defenses. Mackensen had to hurry with his plans before the onset of bad autumn weather, and it was already late September when his forces reached Belgrade. After the taking of Temeziget, one of the biggest islands in the Sava, they made ready to storm the city. The assault troops were given extra ammunition and rations with the knowledge that once the river crossing was made, supplies and reinforcements could not be guaranteed. On the 6th of October, the Central Powers artillery opened fire, bombarding the Serbian lines. Massive artillery, especially heavy howitzers, was the key component in Mackensen's plan. This was a lesson he had learned during the Gorlitz Tarnov offensive earlier in the year, where his heavy artillery repeatedly broke the Russian lines, forcing them back time and again. Also, in addition to the large amounts of heavy howitzers and Meinenwerfer, the Austro-Hungarian river monitor Zamos and other armored steamers of the Danube flotilla also opened fire. Soon, Belgrade and the Serbian positions were in flames as the Austro-Hungarian forces tried to cross the Danube. But Austrian Field Marshal Hermann Koves von Kovesasa had chosen poor spots for the crossing. The ground was swampy and the weather turned for the worse. A heavy rainstorm caused the Danube to swell. Bridgeheads were established, but progress was slow, as most of the pontoon bridges were destroyed by the Serbian artillery or simply swept away by the heavy current. Relentless Serbian counterattacks threatened to destroy the bridgeheads, and the Austro-Hungarians fought with their backs to the river. To assure a safe crossing of the main force, Koves had to take several islands in the river, particularly two islands the Germans named Zigoiner Inseln, Gypsy Islands, or the one they called Great War Island, at the conflux of the Saba and Danube rivers. These were all well fortified by the Serbian defenders, and camouflage machine guns covered every approach over the river, and they could only be taken by close combat. 
even with the assistance of the German 22nd Reserve Corps, commanded by General Eugen von Falkenhayn, the German Army Chief of Staff's brother, progress was slow. Casualties among the assault troops were high. Overrun, you're under the gun. Day and night, the shells kept falling. Sound the drum, the great war has come. Show no fear, the ending is near. But after hours of fighting, most of the Serbian guns defending the city were destroyed by the enemy artillery. The anti-aircraft batteries as well, allowing the German reconnaissance planes to direct fire even more efficiently. The eventual capture of the river islands was the turning point in the battle, as the crossings could now be made in relative safety and the artillery could be moved up. Fighting reached the old fortress of Kalemegdan. Belgrade could not hold out much longer, not without help from the Entente. French troops were en route from Salonika, but it was extremely doubtful they could arrive in time to help. Still, counterattacks were made wherever possible. So while the Austrians at Kalemegdan waited for reinforcements, the men of the Serbian 10th Infantry Regiment under Major Dragutin Gavrilovic prepared such a counterattack. They knew it was likely futile, but they planted their bayonets and prepared to at least delay the enemy from entering the city. This was the moment Major Dragutin Gavrilovic made his speech. Soldiers, exactly at three o'clock, the enemy is to be crushed by your fierce charge, destroyed by your grenades and bayonets. The honor of Belgrade, our capital, must not be stained. Soldiers, heroes, the Supreme Command has erased our regiment from its records. Our regiment has been sacrificed for the honor of Belgrade and the fatherland. Therefore, you no longer need to worry about your lives. They no longer exist. So forward to glory, for the king and the fatherland. Long live the king, long live Belgrade. The story goes that Gavrilovich men stuck flowers to their tunics taken from a flower shop nearby as they prepared to charge to their deaths. It was indeed heroic. Most of Gavrilovich's men were cut down by the Austro-Hungarian guns. Gavrilovich was badly wounded, though saved from death by other survivors who dragged their major back from the fighting so that he, at least, could live to fight another day. The rest is history. On October 9th, Mackensen reported the fall of Belgrade. The relief force from Salonika never made it to the Serbs in time. Bulgaria declared war on Serbia October 14th, and the Austro-German-Bulgarian invasion brought victory to the Central Powers weeks later. Today, Gavrilovic's speech is etched into a monument near the Nebojsa Tower to commemorate their valiant last stand. The stand of a defiant and proud people refusing to be cowed by an overwhelming force. How did you hear the speech in the first place? So, a very long time ago, yeah. I happened to get acknowledged with a girl from Serbia. Okay. This was by the time Sabaton was formed. And we were kind of talking constantly. And she hoped that we would come there and play one day. Yeah. Uh, which I didn't think would ever be possible, because at this time there was a war. And in 2007, we come to Serbia for the first time. Yeah. And I meet with her. Yeah. She shows me around, takes me to the fortress, and tells stories about Belgrade's history. Okay. This was the first time I heard about Mayor Gavrilovic and yeah. the speech and the defense of Belgrade. Yeah. Speech was all I needed to be inspired to write a song. Yeah. So this song we've only performed once. We played in Serbia, in Belgrade, and as a special treat, we had the speech pre-recorded by a famous Serbian uh, actor. And it was magic for us to hear because all the people in the crowd, they yeah. could scream along to they these words. The whole thing. They knew yeah. the words yeah. by heart. Yeah. And we were standing backstage and listening to this and we were full of tears just yeah. before we we're going to play the song because we knew how much this speech, this history meant for the people out there. And when we walk out there to play the song, this was one of the absolute highlights of our entire career playing a song. Wow. And ladies and gentlemen, last dying breath. Vi nemate više da se brinete za živote vaše. Oni više ne postoje. Zato napred u slavu za kralja i otačbinu. Živa kralj! Živa kralj! 
And that was Last Dying Breath. See you next time. Here on Sabaton History. All right, everyone. Remember to subscribe to the Sabaton History Channel, but also to the regular Sabaton, and check out World War II and Time Ghost as well, all right? If you want to see more stuff like this, right there, playlist, click it, and then support us on Patreon, guys, all right? Makes this stuff happen. Take care and see you on the road. Thank you.